Bromoform, chloroform, the anesthetic, familiar, isn't it? So now exchange the three chlorine atoms for bromines. And today that stuff is going to be made radioactive. I have to at least roughly explain what's happening chemically, otherwise the experimental part will be too confusing. Bromine can be made radioactive through an N-gamma reaction, which is a neutron capture. By releasing the excess in energy, the bromine atom can be shot out of the bromoform molecule. The breaking of this bond is an absolute chaos, but it's important to note that only the radioactive bromine bromine atoms can be shot out from the non-polar bromoform. The bromine atoms shot out are bromide ions or bromine radicals. These are water-soluble forms of bromine, making it relatively easy to separate the converted radioactive bromine from the non-radioactive bromine. What do we need for this? Bromoform, 0.5 molar ammonia solution, 2 molar nitric acid, calcium chloride, 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution and potassium bromide. About 30 milliliters were brought to the neutron source and irradiated with thermal neutrons. The neutron source has a neutron flux of about 10 million neutrons per square centimeter per second directly on the surface. Three days later. Now that the bromoform is radioactive, work can begin. Ideally, the ammonia solution is preparated in three 20 milliliters portion and the separation funnel with several containers is already set up. The entire bromoform is poured into the separation funnel as well as the first 20 milliliters of the ammonia solution. Then it's time to shake vigorously. Occasionally release pressure. Once that's done, the stopper is removed from the top and the bromoform can be separated from the aqueous solution. The bromoform is at the bottom and the ammonia solution is at the top. Both are drained into separate containers. It's better to have some of the aqueous ammonia solution with the bromoform than the other way around. Why? Well, this bromoform is now shaken with another 20 milliliters of ammonia solution and a few drops from the previous run makes no difference. We want to make sure that every tiny bit of radioactive bromine goes into the aqueous phase. That's why it's shaken vigorously and washed several times. Once that's done, we now have a aqueous solution with ridiculously small amounts of radioactive bromine. However, we need a solid sample for the measurement. That's why more bromide in the form of small amount of potassium bromide solution is added. The potassium bromide acts as a carrier. And now that we have a large amount of bromide, it can be precipitated with silver nitrate solution. Precipitation reaction always looked nice and the thought of it being partially radioactive silver bromide makes it even cooler. It takes quite a bit of silver nitrate solution because we really want to precipitate all the bromide. The suspension is then run through vacuum filtration, leaving the filter paper with the silver bromide. Optionally, the solid can be scraped together for better measuring results. The whole thing is then placed on the Geiger counter and measured for one minute, followed by a five minute wait, rinse and repeat for a total of 15 of such cycles at six minutes each with one minute of measuring and five minutes of waiting. The measurements are then plotted and of course a background measurement should have been made beforehand. The background count is usually around nine to ten counts per minute. Are we done? No, bromoform is expensive. 200 euros per liter is still a fair price. It gets recycled. So the bromoform is mixed with calcium chloride and vigorously shaken again until the color lightens. Calcium chloride dries the bromoform. The whole mixture can then be filtered and the filtrate is returned into the centrifuge tubes. The filter paper now may contain some contaminated calcium chloride. So it's wrapped in a nice bundle of tape and put into the bromoform waste to decay away there. So, where do we start? Best to start with the star of the show. Bromine, like the halogen above it, chlorine, occurs in nature in two isotopes. The distribution is 75 to 25% chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And with bromine, it's pretty much 50-50 between bromine 79 and 81. Now we want to shoot them with thermal neutrons, which of course only works if the cross section is roughly right. For bromine 79, it's 2.5 barns plus 8.3 barns. Huh? What's that? Well, there is not only a bromine 80G, but also a bromine 80M. 2.5 bonds now describes the cross section for the N gamma reaction from bromine 79 to bromine 80G, and 8.3 bonds describes the cross section for the nuclear reaction to bromine 80M. The same applies to bromine 81, to bromine 82G and 82M. We can pretty much ignore the bromine 82M because it didn't survive the journey from the neutron source all the way to the detector. 
So now we know where the activity comes from, but the most important thing is missing, the isomer separation. This is attributed to the Silla-Chama effect. The CBr bond has a specific energy of 247 kilojoules per mole. If this energy is applied, the bond breaks. How can that be? Well, the metastable bromi-ATM undergoes an isomeric transition into bromi-ATG and the recoil from the emitting photon propels the newly formed bromi-ATG out of the bromophore molecule. Well, not quite like that. Even though that would be a very logical thought, the recoil of that energy is about 0 0.016 electron volts and not the bond energy of the CBR bond converted to electron volts, which is 2.6 electron volts. One solution to this problem is internal conversion. This is a process where the energy of the atomic nucleus is transferred to one of its own shell electrons. An electron hole is created in the inner K shell. Electrons from higher shells fall into this hole emitting X radiation. This X rays can be emitted to further electrons with the same shell, ejecting them and these electrons are so-called Auger electrons. By ejecting a conversion electron, the bromine isomer is propelled out of the bromoform. The occurrence of conversion electrons can be read out of the chart of nucleides. Go watch that video. Another solution to this problem is found way much earlier in the experiment the irradiation process. During the irradiation, bromine-79 and bromine-81 undergo N-gamma reactions. And these gamma photons pack quite a punch. They range up to 10 mega electron volts, which is way more than enough to break the CBR bond with just 2.6 electron volts. Here is where the 0.5% ammonia addition comes into play. Ammonia is a radical scavenger and can react with the newly formed bromi AT and ATU2, pulling them into the aqueous phase. As a brief aside about the carrier material, sure, silver bromide is poorly soluble in water, but if we were to rely only on the bromi AT and ATU2, we would not have exceeded the solubility product of this already low amount of bromide ions. We are not even close to the millimolar range with all this neutron activation radioactive stuff. This is why additional bromide ions are needed so that the silver bromide, including the radioactive bromide ions, can be precipitated out. So what does the curve that we painstakingly worked out over the last 90 minutes on the GMC look like? Ideally something like this. We corrected our measurements for the background and plotted semi-logarithmically against time. Just to be clear, we only concerned about the short-lived bromine ATG and the longer-lived bromine ATM. Bromine AT2M has already decayed long before we could even measure it. And bromine AT2G is so long-lived that we can't plot a decay curve on a typical lab day. We fit a linear function for the longer-lived component, which we obtain our decay constant lambda. And this can then be converted into the half-life using the following equation. The same is done for the shorter-lived component. Okay, great, we understand the half-lives, but sorry, nuclear chemists do not work that old-fashioned anymore. We have an LSC, liquid scintillation count. With this device, we can record better spectra from bromine 80 and bromine 82. That means we secretly made a fourth batch for the video and sprinted as fast as we could from the neutron source to the LSC, even recording a background in the dark. We had to hurry because on a normal lab day, bromine 82 m with a half-life of just 6 minutes has decayed by the time of measurement. The bromoform was shaken with water and mixed with the scintillation cocktail and was measured in the LSC for 90 minutes. It took us 13 minutes from the neutron source to the start of the first measurement. One experimental approach didn't work because the bromoform didn't agree with the chosen scintillation cocktail and we thought we could make life easier by skipping the shaking, but nope. Then at least with water, even though adding the radical scavenger can more than double the yield. But the LSE has an efficiency of up to 100% for betters anyways and we didn't want to do some quantitative analysis. And now look at this beautiful spectrum. This is everything we did manually beforehand, but just automatically and over several hours. We haven't plotted energy values on the x-axis, but you can read it like an energy spectrum. Towards the right, it gets higher in energy, but somewhat exponentially. In the very high energy range, we can see the 2 mega electron volt beta particles from bromine ATG. 
Since we have made a measurement series, we can clearly see the decay of bromine ATG with a half-life of 17.6 minutes. Lower in energy, the 0.5 mega electron volts batters from bromine 82 are easily recognizable. With a half-life of 35.34 hours, we naturally do not see noticeable decay. Now it gets exciting. The slightly lower energy particles that decrease just like bromine ATG can be attributed to it, but are not second beta energies. It does have them, but it would be higher in energy than the bromine AT2G. This is Cherenkov radiation generated by the two mega electron volt betas. Since we shook it with water, when electrons propagate faster than light in a medium, Cherenkov radiation is produced. This is also electromagnetic radiation and can be measured by the photodetectors of the LSC. On the next day, you can clearly see how bromine ATG has decayed and bromine AT2G has comparatively increased. It really hasn't increased, but the x-axis has been scaled differently, making it appear larger. Here you can see the decay curve of the individual bromine isotopes, the short-lived bromine AT in front and the longer-lived bromine 82 in the back. And of course, I also recorded a gamma spectrum during this time and here all peaks are marked. A complete analysis with GMC, beta and gamma spectrum. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, Goodbye.